Hi everybody, welcome to a new edition of Let's Talk About Education with Antonio Corrales. We have talked in this show before about what does it mean to manage educational programs and what does it mean to impact students with different initiatives, but what does it mean to be in charge of the Upward Bound program, uh, the TRIO program, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's an initiative that has been around for quite a while and today we have the honor to have with us Mr. Ciro Reyes, who is in charge of an Upward Bound program at a community college it's going to be explained in simple terms what does it mean for us and for our students' life. Tito, thank you so much for being with us thank today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Why don't we start by letting you introduce yourself to the audience and kind of letting them know, you know, how did you get to where you are in your career? Okay. Well, my name is Tito Reyes. Uh, like you said, I am the director here at College of the Mainland in Texas City. Um, and I run the TRIO programs, which is Upward Bound and Student Support Services. But my career started actually in a small town in uh, Luling, Texas, Central Texas, outside of San Marcos, Austin area. Um, I am a first generation individual. So, you know, and later on, we'll talk a little bit about the programs. But that's one of the things that really um, motivated me was, you know, being a low income first generation um, college student and, and encountering, you know, a lot of barriers as you're, you're uh, going through your college experience. Um, my par- my parents are, are are from Mexico, you know, so I'm both first generation um, American, um, and even with that, it also entailed a lot of uh, barriers as well. Um, I also come from a family of ten, you know. I was the only individual in my family um, that actually was able to go to college and succeed in college and and get a college degree. Um, I did go to South Texas, uh, Texas A&M Kingsville, um, and got my degree in communications and a minor in sociology, um, I saw myself doing something else, you know, I, but when I was there, luckily for me, I did work for the college in their human resource office, which really wasn't something that I wanted to do, um, but it was a job, so I was able to work there, and an opportunity actually came open um, within the TRIO programs um, as an advisor, and so I was, you know, luckily I got the job and I've been working with TRIO ever since, which it's coming up on on 20 years. Um, wow. I, I really enjoy it. I think um, working for TRIO, um, it's something that you either have a passion for it or you don't. Um, because, again, the type of students that we work with do have a lot of barriers. You know, they're the students that statistically... Um, the barriers are going to cause them not to be able to be successful in college. A lot of the barriers are, you know, personal, financial, cultural. And so with TRIO programs, we're able to really handhold the students through through their college career. And I think for me, it really was a good fit because I can take what I experienced in my journey through college and really kind of show the students that even though you have those barriers, you're still able to be successful. Um, And a lot of times, you know, being smart and utilizing the resources, whether it's TRIO on a college campus or other resources that they're smart about it. um, Culturally, a lot of times students um, maybe are embarrassed or think they can do it on their own. And for, for me, I take my experiences and tell students, it's not embarrassing to go to tutoring. It's not embarrassing to go talk to your advisor if you're having problems in, in, in a class because those students that go out there and seek the assistance are typically those students that are going to be most successful in a, um, you know, in their college journey. So I think for me, it really was like a perfect fit because of my journey and what I went through um, in higher ed and with TRIO giving the students that knowledge of what I went through to help them be successful in, in, in their careers. So so for our, our viewers that have no idea what TRIO and Upward Bound, uh, Upward Bound program means, can you describe in real? Sure. Real, like- um, with TRIO, um, our, our federal grants uh, that the Department of Education established in the, uh, like 1965 during the Lyndon B. Johnson's uh, kind of war on poverty, um, and so TRIO was the original three TRIO programs that were established, which was Upward Bound, Student Support Services, and Talent Search. Those were the, I guess, the pilot programs that were established. And again, they were established to help first-generation low-income and students with disabilities um, provide them with like a safety net. 
Um, and the one that we're talking about, and particularly right now, Upward Bound, that one starts at the high school. Um, and really, in a nutshell, it's really kind of establishing a college-going culture for high school students. Um, again, but, all, but also a specific population, right? Yeah. Yes, but it's a particular population because they you do identify the students early on. Your goal in an Upward Bound program is to identify the students at the ninth grade year. That's the ideal time to identify them. That way you work with them for the next four years on really establishing that college going culture, you know, teaching them the importance of college, teaching them what it's going to take to be successful in college. If they want to go to competitive schools, what do they have to do and, now? And how do you identify that? Like, for example, if you, you, you go to a high school, okay. you, 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 you look at their, I don't know, are they, are they, are they free and reduced lunch mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. Are they single parents? Are they at risk? How okay. do you... Um, well, what we do is is uh, we actually start doing presentations at the spring of eighth grade year when they're finishing up their eighth grade year. Um, but we go to the schools, do presentations with the, with uh, in the classrooms. We've created a YouTube, you know, five-minute YouTube video that we encourage teachers to show in their classroom. Um, the teachers will show the video in the classroom, talk about Upper Bound, And then those students that are interested typically will either do assemblies um, at the end of the day so that we don't cut into classroom instruction where those students that saw the video and are interested can come and we'll do a full-fledged presentation on the program. Um, or if teachers are, are, are okay with us coming into the classroom, we will come into the classroom and again, just go more in deep and in depth on, on what the program is, the expectations of the program. Um, the application process is lengthy because again, we are uh, asking a student to commit to the program for four years. So of course it asks for teachers recommendations, parents, um, uh, an essay by the student, expectations of the parent. We want to make sure that we're on the same page with the parent. Um, and so we, we kind of asked the parent, what are your expectations of your child? How much importance do you place on a college education? Because once they become juniors and seniors, you know, we do see students become a little bit more lazy. Um, and so we want the parents to be on our side and push the student to go to the things that Upper Bound requires, like the Saturday meetings, volunteer projects, a SAT, ACT prep. Um, and then we interview the student. You know, we do have a rubric where we kind of give students um, points. Like if, 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 if your parents um, have both have a college education, you may get less points than if your parents don't have a college education. Off the rubric, you earn points. Um, we, we grade their essay to see how, what their goals and ambitions are. Um, because the, the program is, is geared towards students that, um, that may be a little bit rougher around the edges, but we feel that with Upward Bound, we can guide them to be college going material and be successful in college. Right. If we look at a student that's maybe number one in their class and maybe is a go-getter already, not that we don't want that student, but that student's probably going to be successful right. even without the program. So it's a combination of, of a bunch of different criteria that we have in our rubric to make sure that, that we recruit those students that maybe are a diamond in the rough, but with the program, we can help them cultivate um, a college going uh, mentality mm -hmm. and also help them realize, you know what, I got to step it up in high school. You know, I got to step it up if I want to get into those particular schools. Well, following up on that, so, so for example, from the student perspective, what, is, what in your opinion, what is the add value that a student who may be looking at us right now, uh, who are in high school or, or uh, any other level, mm -hmm. they may, or parents who may be looking at us, What what is the add value for our students to participate in an upper bound program in any organization? Okay. I think one of the benefits of the program is um is is just is the exposure mm -hmm. of the colleges in upper bound. You know, in, in in our community, a lot of our students may go to visit College of the Mainland, may go to visit UH Clear Lake. But with Upward Bound, our kids in the four years, if they get into our program, will get to go to at least, I would say, 15 to 20 different colleges and universities nice. in the state and outside of the state. Um, 
Well, also, you know, the, the terminology that our students will learn. You know, and, one, and, and, and all free, yeah. It's all free. Right? It's all free. Exactly. Um, the grant covers um, all the expenses for our students. That's we awesome. do, we, you know, we do understand that, you know, 70 to 80 percent of our students will be on um, considered reduced low income, income because they, they qualify through their school district on free and reduced lunch. Yeah. So we would never ask our students to participate in an activity where where there would be cost, you know, um, because our biggest goal is that we expose our students to post-secondary education, expose them to opportunities, you know, and I tell our students, the majority of them will come to calm because of, of the cost, it's, it's close to home, but, you know, we want to give them that opportunity to go visit UT, go visit Rice, go visit uh, U, uh, UT Austin, um, visit colleges in South Texas, um, we want them to have that opportunity to be exposed. And also, you know, even though a lot of them will come to Calm, they will eventually finish Calm. You know, UH Clear Lake, you know, we will take our, we usually try to go there um, multiple times throughout the year because we are the feeder school there. But we want our kids to know what is there. You know, we don't want them to just apply to UH Clear Lake um, without knowing what right. programs they have and also connect them with, with, with people that are there. Um, we do have uh, former TRIO students that are employees there and continuously develop relationships like with Dr. Corrales or Dr. Peters that may be, you know, students that are that are going to be going on into the future that we can at least connect them with someone that's there that can maybe be a mentor to them as they, you know, go through the programs there at, at, um, at UH Clear Lake. But let me ask you something, you know, you being a first generation um you know, successful story, um, students who have gone to college. In your opinion, you know, we know that a lot of students struggle a lot with the cycle of poverty and, mm -hmm. you know, um, breaking that that mentality and to see the light uh, and, and see college mm -hmm. and see education as, a, as, a, as, a, as an exit to, mm -hmm. to a better life. In your opinion, what are the, what are the, hardest part of of one of those students to being successful in, in a college? I think the hardest part is uh, honestly the home life. Okay. Um, the home life. Um, and Because and, I, I had two extremes. Yeah. You know, I had a parent that contacted me. Um, we tried in the last couple of years is really bring our parents into the process. I think in the past we focused the process on just the students. Um, in the last three to four years, we've had parent meetings um, to let them know what's going on, bo both at the schools and our juniors and seniors, what to expect um, to bring them into the fold um, and have more buy-in to the parents. Um, and so I had a parent that the, uh, that the daughter's really bright and has been getting a lot of... Uh, so they got invited to like an honor society for future uh, medical doctors to go to a conference. And so they went um, and it was pricey. Now they got invited to another one. Mm -hmm. And so I told Ms. Mendez, I would like to speak with the mom. And the mom called me and I kind of told her, I said, the, the program that she got invited to is a legitimate program. But I, I unfortunately, I think that that the other one sold your information to this one. Yeah. And I said, what I don't want is I don't want to put, I don't want you to get into a financial situation to where you're sending your daughter to all these different conferences. Um, and it's a good way to network, I said, but it's going to be at a very expensive cost because they're yeah. trying to charge you $3,000. Wow. But the mom is, is very involved. Mm -hmm. And she said, Mr. Reyes, I appreciate that you that you took the time to kind of explain it to me and I'm kind of seeing what you're saying. Do I want to send her? Absolutely, I want to send her. Um, and so in that situation, that's a parent that is involved. Mm. But on the other side, um, you know, we also get those parents that that are, are disconnected that think, okay, well, my child is in the program and y'all are gonna make sure that they're successful. Um, and so now, a lot of times, unfortunately, I do. I'm a I'm a believer that it's going to take a village. It's going to take the parent as much as it's going to take the program. So one of the biggest obstacles that I see with 
our programs or when the student is not as successful as I would want is um, the parents, you know, the outside forces, social uh, society issues that are going on with the student that kind of uh, hinders their success. That may, and, have, and, may, have, may make it harder for them, mm-hmm. you know, the dysfunctionality at home and, and the yeah. lack of resources. Oh, yeah, of you know, and just the the you know, the lack of understanding on on the part of either the parent or, or, or even the student because, you know, you can continuously tell the student, go to college, your life's going to be easier, go to college, your life's going to be easier. And we have, you know, students that unfortunately, you know, we can beat them and they will take a different direction, you know. Um, but, but, but from your perspective, that not from a director perspective, and now talking not to students or parents, but talking to educators out there, what are the tools that you utilize to motivate those to having experienced kind of similar situations? I mean, how do you, how do you, what are, what are the tools? How do you engage students or catch their attention mm-hmm. into college? Uh, when when they you may see them that they have that much dysfunctionality at home or they may not have resources mm-hmm. because what happens is a lot of our educators they either not, they don't know mm-hmm. or they think that. Sadly, they think that everybody has regular functional homes, but the reality is a lot of our students have um, uh, really difficult situations at their household, and sometimes we expect them to perform at the same level. Yeah. Not that we're looking for excuses, but yeah. but you know having that level of understanding. So from from the educator perspective, what do you use or what do you do to engage those? One students? of the things that that we started <clears throat> doing. And I think in the next couple of years, we're going to try to elaborate a little bit more and develop it more is for us in particularly is inviting, uh, creating a mentor, uh, mentorship program. Um, and for us, we're really going to try to focus on on bringing back former upward bound students, um, bringing back students that were in the exact same position that our current students are in, because I, I agree. I think a lot of times students are like, oh, well, you know, that cycle of poverty is really hard to break, yes. you know, or maybe even not even poverty, but just going to the next step, cool. you know, going on from a high school degree. You know, maybe your parents do have high school, but ma- ne- taking the next step to a bachelor's degree. Mm-hmm. And so what we're going to do is we're really going to try to focus on developing a strong mentorship program with our alum that have been success stories that have left our community you know uh some of our community does have a high non-college going rate and so i i want to invite students that have made it out of the community and have had success stories to show our students that you know if you play your card right and you invest your time in the program you know you will have opportunities um because again a lot of times our students um don't want to leave our area you know for some reason um they are like stuck here and so i want to uh, i want to really develop a mentorship program with with our students and again not just our students but people that have similar backgrounds that can bring their story so that our students can kind of connect with the story um from the mentor and realize you know what i do have opportunities because this person was in the exact same situation that i'm in now and look where they're at now um, our students don't see a lot of success stories. They don't see a lot of people that look like them. You know, we do service a high number of, you know, Hispanic and African-American students. And I think that that exposing them to more people that look like them that have been success stories will help them, you know, connect with individuals that, that you know, that they can say, you know what, um, they did it and I can do it. Because, mm. you know, I remember going back when I was in high school i didn't have a lot of people that looked like me luckily for me i think yeah. going to a predominantly hispanic college really helped me yeah. and kind of showed me you know our president was hispanic our vps were hispanic um that you know maybe i can you know be successful be somebody like that somebody. exactly now you know from now putting your hat as director of the program and and talking about your job specifically and we're talking now to future higher ed administrators okay. who may be looking at us right now, students who maybe need a doctoral program or 
or professional who may be saying, you know, I want to be somebody some someday, somebody like Zero. You know, what are, what are, how does a day in your job look like? What are the most fun part of your job and what are the most challenging part of your job? Um, I think the funnest part, you know, is the interaction with the students. You know, even though I don't get to see as many students today as, let's say, 10 years ago, um, I still think that, you know, talking to students, you know, seeing their journey right now, you know, having a student come in and say, oh, Mr. A is, you know, I got accepted to Prayer View. Uh, I'm really excited. Um, or even the struggles, you know, like I'm struggling in math. You know, because I do understand that a college journey is not always going to be, you know, at a Linear. success. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to have its ups and it's going to have its, its downs. And so I think for me, you know, that is, is really exciting. Um, with the Upward Bound program, seeing our students go from one grade, you know, when they were recruited, when they were freshmen, to see their senior year and them applying to college, um, you know, whether it's here to College of the Mainland or going on getting accepted to UT. Um, I think for me, that is the part of my program that I really enjoy is is developing those relationships with those students and seeing them um, go on in whatever and, you know, whatever path they're going to be taking. That to me is the fun part, um, because, again, with the programs that we work with, you know, we do work with those students that do have more barriers than um, a lot of other college students. So to me, that's the fun part. The, I would say the part that's not as fun is the more administrative, um, the more of like, how are we, you know, how, how are we going to integrate our program into the institution? With TRIO program, you know, a lot of times they're so different than what the institution is already doing. You know, we are grants. So uh, we're always trying to find a way to ensure that we're still getting a piece of that uh, pie within the institution because Upward Bound, is, is, is it a recruitment program? It, um, is, it a, uh, is it a retention program? It's, a, it's technically, I guess, it would be a, retention pro a recruitment program for the institution because most Upward Bounds do funnel a huge portion of their students into the institution as they're graduating. Um, and so I think that for me, the battles that we have to have, luckily for, for us at, at, at our institution, um, both our dean and our VP come from trio backgrounds. So we do get that um, support and that advocacy at the higher levels um, for us. But, you know, you always hear stories of, of, of programs that, you know, that don't have that support. And so so, so you, you guys keep that network? Yes. Because, I mean, the students who go through three years now, Ex you, yes. get, you get keep in contact? Hey, oh, yeah, yes. Um, awesome. We always do. Um, we had a former, um, a former up, Upward Bound student here at Calm that graduated from Upward Bound and then stayed here at the community college, so transitioned into their student support services. Now she... Uh, just maybe two months ago, got a job in Washington, D.C., working for the National TRIO Advocacy wow. Group that goes on to uh, the Heal wow. and advocates for TRIO. Um, right. And so uh, so we do keep up with our students. And she was one that, that I always saw would go on um, and go to D.C. And the, have, so have you seen the change from the students since you took them to the... when they? go to college have you seen a change in their mentality towards college or? oh yeah i think for our students um and again you're always going to have those that mature um later on yeah. um and but but you do see those students that um that are always like uh wanting more wanting Correct. more knowledge wanting to know more how do i get into this college you asking you know you know, I'm really looking to go to UT. You know, are y'all seeing that a trip in the radar um, in the near future? So with our students, you know, we, we do run the gamut, you know, with with kind of where they're at educationally. You know, our freshmen, um, they are just kind of like the, the sky is the limit for them. You know, they just want to learn versus when you're 
working with your seniors, they're a little, they're definitely more laser focused as to, okay, I'm staying at calm. What programs are offered there? How can I get to UT or get to Clear Lake um, to make sure that I get my, you know, uh, computer science degree? We have a lot of our, our upper bound students that are kind of going towards computer science. And so, you know, for us, it's kind of really work, uh, working with, with the different stages that our students are in. And you see, again, as, as they go, become sophomores, they start thinking program-wise. As they become juniors, they start thinking what colleges have what I need. Once they become seniors, they're really, okay, what do I need to do to apply to that particular school to make mm -hmm. sure that I achieve my goal? And for us, you know, like I said, it's, yeah. it's really being more of a tailor-made program so, right. for, for our students because right. we do understand that, that you know, like I said, they're at different stages in, in their life. And I think that's really kind of what makes our program unique also mm -hmm. is that we kind of tailor it to the specific student and where, what stage they're at in their high school career. Now, you are humble, but you are in charge of the entire, you, you, you are the director of the entire Houston re, uh, area in terms of the uh, uh, trio programs mm -hmm. and, and upper one program, uh, which is a big responsibility. And from that perspective, uh, do you see similar challenges across the board? I mean, oh, yeah. Or, I think I'll give you an example. I think that a lot of times trio programs are very similar mm -hmm. um, in reference to the, the struggles of making sure that your program is successful. Um, And with upward bounds, I would say senioritis, for example, is one that a lot of us have been talking about. Um, is, that, is that really bad? Can you explain for our folks? Sure. What does that mean? Um, Because that usually, happen. like freshmen and sophomores, there's like they're they're like I want to learn, I want to go on trips, I want to go to colleges, and then this year, for example, a lot of our seniors, um, you know, no matter how prepared you are, um, senior year happens, you know, and for us. By the fall semester, our kids should have done their applications. Now they can even do their financial aid early. And it's like pulling teeth and nails to get them they, to complete. They the start getting lazy, right? They start getting lazy because they see graduation, the light at yeah. the end of the tunnel. And, you know, what we try to stress to them is like we get graduation and it's a it's a huge accomplishment for you. But there's additional things that we need yeah. to do to make sure that come um, June, if you're going to do summer school, or come September, if you're going to yeah. wait until the fall, to make sure that that you continue, yeah. you know, that you, you've done everything you needed to so that it doesn't stop. You know, we've had students that, that you know, come, to, come August, they're like, oh, I need to go to school in the fall. And we're like, well, where were you all last year? Mm -hmm. And so we have to you know, scramble to make sure that they get admitted into the college, get their testing done. Now you didn't do your financial aid, so you're going to get it late. So now you need to come up with somehow to pay for it. Um, and wow. so, you know, a lot of the schools will run into that. Um, and so one of the things that we do, and particularly with the upward bounds, is that we do meet quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, and we throw out, you know, struggles that the other programs are having How, you know, what are you doing to address tutoring? Maybe you're having low tutoring. What are you doing to make sure that your students are coming to tutorings? Or, or you know, what issues have you had? You know, sometimes we hire travel companies. You know, have you had any issues with those particular? And we, we also, you know, good programs that are, you know, or I should say maybe companies, consulting companies that are working well with us You know, we share that information to the upper bounds because one of the things we always say is don't reinvent the wheel. Something that's working in your program could possibly work at mine. It may not. But, you know, we do we, the upper bounds in the area, I think, are have the strongest um, alliance, you know, and, um, at working together, troubleshooting programs so that, you know, we can keep it in house. Um, um, but I but I do oversee all the trio All, all the trio programs in the Houston area. That is awesome. Um, for Which the, is would be. Yes. That's a yes lot of um, we, there's probably 
institutions and nonprofits in the Houston area that have at least a trio program. Hmm. Um, I would say at least 15 to 20 different, um, like I said, nonprofits hmm. and higher ed institutions. Um, and then a lot of them have multiple one, you know, Texas Southern has probably five or four different programs. College of the Mainland has two, some have three, some may only have one, but it does add up. And so we try to meet also quarterly, um, and it's, it's more of a dissemination type of program of what's going on, you know, what's going on in Washington, D.C. Um, this coming year, one of our biggest push is to do a uh, Houston Trio Day in the Houston area. And I know we've been trying to push it for a while, but it seems like this year it may have uh, had finally some traction. So we're hoping maybe late fall, early spring that we do a day where all the trio programs in the Houston area can get together and, you know, part of it would be volunteer where we give back to the community, but also teach our students a little bit about the history of trio. Um, because a lot of them, they're just like, oh, I'm in Upward Bound, but they don't know the history of it. There's been times when it's literally been on the chopping block, like, and we've had legislators that have stepped up and said, no, they're good programs and we're going to fund them. Um, and so we want our students to gain a little bit of, of the history of it. And then also invite uh, community leaders to come and talk um, to our students on behalf of, of the TRIO programs and what's going that on in D.C. Now, so to, to kind of finish it up, in your opinion, since you have been so involved with community college, how do you see the future of community colleges in, in, in our society in America? Um, well, I, you know, it's funny that you asked me that question because prior to coming to College of the Mainland, uh, my experience was mostly in universities. And so I think for me, um, it did take a little adjustment in, in the way that community colleges work. And now I wholeheartedly believe in them. I think that, that with the cost, you know, with the cost of, of higher ed, I think that um, it's a great stepping stone for students to uh, kind of get their feet wet, um, whether it's through dual, dual credit or or as a as a traditional incoming student. Um, but I really do see them growing uh, drastically with a lot of the certificate programs um, that are that that are going to be coming in in uh, in the works. Um, I think it's a great place for students to start their careers, but also, you know, do their first two years. You know, even here at our institution with a lot of the, the STEM programs that are in the works for us, I think um, it gives students an opportunity to start locally, um, maybe keep costs down, and then transition into a four-year school. Um, we do get a lot of students, even with Upper Bound, that that want to go directly to a four-year. Um, but what we do is encourage them in the summer when you're home, go to the local community college. And so, you know, even here at our institution, we've seen a big jump in increase in, in enrollment. Um, and so right now we're kind of scrambling to make space for kind of the projected increase in, in enrollment that that we anticipate in the next couple next couple of years but um, I think for me it really did open up a different um, probably sector of the population that uh, that would and benefits from a community college that even before I came I didn't have that you know students that maybe didn't learn the curriculum that they should have learned at a uh, at in their in their school mm -hmm now can come to the community college, strengthen up their core curriculum, and be successful once they transition into a... Uh, Closing those gaps. Exactly. And, which is something, again, that I had to learn when I came, because before, all I had done was universities. Right. And I didn't see that gap that exists until I came to the community college and saw that there is a gap in between higher ed and, and secondary education that needs to be addressed. I would hate, you know, and when I meet with even upper bound students that haven't closed that gap, I would be doing the student a disservice to send them to a four year knowing that they're not going to be successful and they're going to have a higher debt than 
had they come to the community college. We started with their developmental courses, um, solidified their foundation, and then send them on to a, um, to a four-year institution. Right. And so I think for me, that really was something that I had to learn by coming to a community college and looking, you know, people that haven't experienced community college uh, that are maybe just working at, at, at four-year institutions haven't been exposed to. And I think for me, that was a really good thing that I learned. And I've been here 14 years and, and even the first two years were rough because it was so different than a four-year institution yeah. that I struggled. Yeah. It took me a while to embrace it. And now looking back, even at my education, I sometimes think, you know what, I could have gone to good community college and done my two years and then gone on to a four year, you know, um, because I'd really see so much benefits, you know, of, of a student starting locally. Um, and, and, and again, for a variety of different reasons, Absolutely. whether it's financial or Academics. maybe they're not academically. Yeah. Um, but I do see them growing. I, I see, um, communities embracing them as unfortunately as tuition continues to rise at um, in, in higher education. I think that that uh, community college will be the pathway for a lot of communities um, and, and students as they, as kind of they move through their educational path. That is fantastic. Well, I want to thank you one more time for being with us today. Folks, so remember that we had this interview and many others on Antonio Corrales' YouTube channel, uh, StarlingEvaluationAssessment.com. Uh, please help somebody today and see you next time. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm.